So on this uh, video podcast, I wanted to basically take the position that uh, letters of intent to the daily journals should not be a substitute for bill amendments. I think a number of lobbyists and staff at the California State Capitol have noticed in recent years a trend that uh, there's a greater usage of letters to the Assembly and Senate daily journals at the end of session that are being used as a substitute for making substantive bill amendments. Some have viewed this new phenomenon as possibly due to the advent of the effective date of Prop 54 and its requirement that a bill be in print in its final form for 72 hours. So that effectively precludes some last minute amendments, even clarifying amendments to bills certainly during the last full three days of the legislative session. Uh, Prop 54 took effect in the 2018 session and has been around in the last couple of legislative sessions. Because bills cannot be amended in the final 72 hours of the session, it seems that a number of bill authors and interest groups behind those have begun utilizing these letters of intent to the journals in an effort to perhaps modify their intent or even address concerns with explicit language that cannot be amended into a bill. Unfortunately, the use of these letters is not a true substitute for actually making uh, changes to the statutory language contained in a bill. So by way of background, both houses of the California legislature provide a process by which a legislator can publish a letter in either the Assembly Daily Journal used by the author of a bill in the Assembly, an AB, or the Senate Daily Journal, generally used by the author of a Senate bill, in order to explain some ambiguity or perhaps the legislator's intent behind his or her bill. Now, historically, the Assembly and Senate have published these letters in their respective daily journals for a number of reasons, again, such as to explain an ambiguity in the bill, to explain particular changes in the law that are being proposed by that bill, or for a myriad of other reasons. And during the last uh, couple of legislative sessions since Prop 54 took effect, their use seems to have expanded as a potential substitute for actual bill language. Now, when considering the intent of the legislature, assuming there's ambiguity in the otherwise uh, language of the bill, state courts don't generally consider statements by individual legislators. This dates back to even the early 1930s uh, in decisions by the California Supreme Court, such as the case of INRE application of Levine. Even when the individual legislator is the author of a bill, the courts view it as not being able to guarantee that the other members of the legislature who voted for that bill actually shared the same views about the bill as the author. Uh, the Cal Supreme Court identified this in the case of In Re Marriage of Boquette in 1976. So for this reason, the state courts generally will only consider letters to the journal when the expression of intent appears to convey more than a merely personal view of the proponent of the bill. Like the Cal Supreme Court said in the 1993 case of Roberts versus City of Palmdale. The Supreme Court really assessed the legal relevance of these letters of intent made to the Daily Journal in that 1976 Cal Supreme Court in Ray the Marriage of Boquette or Bouquet. In that case, the Cal Supreme Court held that a statement from a legislator is entitled to consideration when it reiterates the arguments leading up to the adoption of the legislation rather than merely the personal views of the author. The state court has made clear since then um, that what level of weight should be given. And while letters to the journal are admissible, they exist on one end of the spectrum concerning indicia of legislative intent. 
for example, in Ray marriage of Bouquet, the Cal Supreme Court said, to say that the letter properly bears upon the issue of legislative intent is not to hold that it necessarily concludes that issue. In many cases, the indicia of intent are in conflict and the proper construction of the statute requires us to impute weight to expressions of intent in accord with their probative value. Thus, a motion to print a letter of legislative intent commands less respect than a formal resolution of legislative intent. Likewise, an individual legislator's recount of the argument preceding the passage of a bill probably merits less weight than extensive committee reports on the bill or a formal record of legislative debates. Letters to the journal will be stronger indicia of intent when they've been agreed to by both the policy committee and minority consultants and passed by unanimous consent. The appellate court in People versus Ramos in 1996 made this point in a footnote, footnote 12. In addition, letters not practically available to the entire legislature are not as strong indicia as letters that were available prior to the legislative vote. The Cal Supreme Court said this in White versus Ultramar in footnote two. And it's also helpful if those letters to the journal were exposed to public view like the Cal Supreme Court said in 1981 in California Teachers Association versus San Diego Community College District. Now, one practical problem is that almost all of these letters to the journal are printed after the floor votes have taken place. And so the courts are less likely to view them as having been taken into account by the legislature as a whole and by most legislators before they cast their votes. Regardless of the weight to be given to these letters to the journal, they can't be used to contradict provisions of a statute, the proposed statutory language in a bill, or for example, add or change language to a bill that does not exist. In other words, letters to the journal are given nominal value by state courts and are only utilized when there's ambiguity in examining the statute. If there is an ambiguity, then extrinsic evidence of legislative intent, such as journal letters, are usually not reviewed by the state courts. If there is ambiguity, then this evidence may be considered, but it certainly is not deemed to be dispositive of determining legislative intent. And the letter to the journal has to provide guidance to a state court to ascertain the intent of the legislature. Again, it can't be utilized to change the plain language of the statute or to provide some alternative interpretation of the bill's language when that is not written into statute. In the end, if legislators or interest groups behind these bills want the language of a bill to say something or mean something else than what is found in the bill, then they're going to have to amend the bill prior to the 72-hour rule taking effect, or frankly, wait until the next legislative session to amend the bill to properly reflect their desired outcome. <laughs>